Warning, the following video contains spoilers for Resident Evil 1 and 2 Remake. The opinions stated in this video are entirely my own, and the overlay found in some gameplay is because I captured this footage live. With that out of the way, please enjoy the video. The last time I visited Resident Evil on this channel, I discussed why I consider the original remake as the peak of the series and one of the best games ever made. The only issue is it's difficult to recommend to the modern audience. The core gameplay mechanics are incredible, the level design is outstanding, and the story is quite charming, but those loading screens, ink ribbons, punishing overall design, tank controls, fixed camera angles, and can be voice acting may detract from the refined foundation Mikami and team established back in 2001. So, what happens when you reimagine the sequel with a director who's been with Capcom since the original Resident Evil? We receive one of the best remakes in the gaming medium. When trying to convince friends to play the original Resident Evil, everyone I knew said the fixed camera angles and controls were just too difficult to get into. Resident Evil 2, by comparison, harbors the same DNA while introducing numerous enhancements, streamlining the experience. Streamlining mechanics is always risky though. It's a delicate balancing act of sustaining core mechanics while evolving them to appeal to more modern audiences. However, when implemented properly, developers can reimagine a classic game for modern audiences and enhance the experience for players of the original. Remakes also vary in quality. Some of them replace originals, while others deviate so far from the source that they may as well be a new game. Nevertheless, Capcom has a mostly incredible track record with remakes since 2001. They remain the gold standard for remaking older games, and I believe 2019's Resident Evil 2 Remake is an excellent case study of both modernizing a classic while also preserving its legacy. That's enough of the preamble though. Let's see how we got here by discussing Resident Evil 2's development history. Resident Evil 2 Remake, or RE2R, entered full production in 2015 with series veteran Kazunori Kadoi serving as the creative director. Kazunori has been involved with each of the mainline Resident Evil games since the very first one. With RE2R, the team endeavored to return to a more classic survival horror design by reducing the random elements prevalent between RE4 to 6. Additionally, the team went back and forth on the camera perspective, eventually landing on the third-person camera. The classic third-person camera was leveraged because it captures a sense of claustrophobia and prevented the game from feeling like a shooter, which I'm assuming is how they perceived RE7. I love RE7 as a return to form for the series, but I'd be lying if I said it didn't turn into a head-tapping FPS adventure halted by unskippable cutscenes after multiple playthroughs. Another important design philosophy the team attempted to capture was the flow of the original. By flow, I'm assuming Kazunori meant the gameplay flow of searching for items, planning a route to explore, looking for shortcuts, and stumbling upon a save room. The modus operandi here was to capture the original flow while streamlining it for modern audience tastes. Keep this in mind because we'll be revisiting this later. In an attempt to capture the cinematic essence of fixed camera angles, the team added additional darkness and corners to keep new and returning players on edge. The team also wanted to evolve the zombies you encounter throughout the game as well. Anyone who's played a lot of Resident Evil eventually stops worrying about zombies zombies or use strategies from previous games to deal with them. Aware of this, Kazunori and team focused on creating zombies where players are forced to actually take each engagement seriously. This results in zombies moving more erratically, adding gunshot wounds, varying zombie health pools, numerous ragdoll animations on death, and even faking death animations. Combine this with the eerie atmosphere and the incredible sound design and you get these dense levels delivering several emotions ranging from fear to elation. The team also took some creative freedoms with plot elements and character introductions. Chief Irons was highlighted as Claire meets him after their first encounter with Birkin now. The most difficult part of development from what I read appeared to be redesigning the cast. Characters like Claire and Ada commonly appeared as the most difficult since they haven't appeared much throughout the entire series. Ada this specifically went through numerous designs and was internally debated until landing on a trench coat glasses wearing FBI spy. All jokes aside, hopefully the design team's worries were quelled shortly after fans got their hands on the final product. Ada and the rest of the cast look incredible and offer great performances throughout the entire game's runtime. So how well did these production initiatives translate to the final product? Well, they shattered everyone's expectations. The team did an excellent job bringing their vision to life with the new-ish RE engine at the time. One of the first things players realized when RE7 and RE2 were revealed are almost certainly the graphical prowess of the RE engine. Originally debuted in 2017's RE7, the RE engine allows Capcom to implement graphics they refer to as stylized reality. Now, I'm nowhere near qualified to talk about engine specifics, but these games, visually speaking, look outstanding. Most AAA games look great today, so it's really not that impressive, but this game came out five years ago as of writing this, and it still looks great. A growing sentiment I've heard from the broader gaming community is that everyone seems to be okay trading graphics for better gameplay. Resident Evil games today feel like Capcom asking, why do you have to choose? 
RE7, RE2R, and RE3R still look great and function incredibly. I believe Capcom has struck an incredible balance between gameplay and graphical prowess other companies should strive to achieve. Other developers that come to mind who achieve this balance are Atlas and Supergiant Games. Both of these developers utilize their limited budgets to harmonize incredible gameplay mechanics with unique aesthetics providing each game with their own identities. Getting back to RE2R, sure RE4 and RE8 look better, but they aren't huge graphical leaps when compared to RE2R. The blood, gore, textures, character models, reflections, lighting, hair physics, and everything still look incredible by modern standards. The only minor complaint I have is that there's some weird lighting that can occur making textures look weird, but it's the only technical issue that I've had since 2019, and it's not enough to detract from the otherwise great experience. Anyways, these incredible graphics help players get immersed in the world of RE2R and amplifies the overall presentation of this game as well. When you get past the gorgeous visuals and fighting for your life, of course, players will realize how incredible the overall sound design is. The sound of firearms, footsteps as you travel throughout the stages, the rain, echoes in the room, and the ability to pinpoint where everything is based on audio is incredible. Most Resident Evil games, these especially, are best played with a great pair of headphones or speakers to really allow you to get immersed in Capcom dense atmosphere. There were numerous instances where I was constantly scanning the room, looking for Mr. X, scared to alert liquors, hearing groans, windows breaking, and or ambient noises contributing to this terrifying atmosphere that I was in. Another element Capcom employed to create a more haunting atmosphere are with the flashlights. Flashlights are typically leveraged in horror games to mitigate player control and overall vision. Hiding enemies, puzzle items, unlockables, and other things in the dark forces players' cones of vision to focus on the radius of the flashlight or in English, you can only see what you're looking at. Developers use this to create more tense atmospheres and scare players by forcing them to engage with the game as developers intend them to, and I'm okay with Capcom's approach here. The reason I'm okay with Capcom's approach here is because they don't solely rely on this to create their horrifying environments. No. Capcom develops incredible environments bolstered by classic survival horror design to create these levels rather than focusing on hide and seek elements commonly found in other horror games with a heavy reliance on an illumination mechanic. The reason I'm dedicating so much time to the flashlight is because of how deliberate Capcom was with its inclusion. In a developer interview, the team claimed that flashlights were introduced to capture the essence of fixed camera angles. Fixed camera angles were a byproduct of hardware limitations and are used today as more of an artistic choice. As I said in my RE1 video, tank controls and fixed camera angles have an incredible synergy and allows developers to fully control what you experience. Nonetheless, the industry has evolved from these design choices and now uses flashlights to emulate this design philosophy. Personally, I don't like having this conversation though. Comparing flashlights utility to fixed camera angles and tank controls are like comparing apples and oranges. They both have entirely different ways of limiting control. I don't think these two should be compared as is, and I believe they're mutually exclusive in both execution and design intent. What I do enjoy discussing, however, is how well Capcom reimagined this game's narrative. As I stated earlier, this isn't a one-to-one -one remake of the original story. Some characters receive additional development, are introduced at new times, receive text fleshing out their motivations, and are used differently than in the original. The team did a great job taking creative freedoms while keeping the original story intact in my opinion. Watching Claire and Sherry's relationship develop throughout the narrative was great. Marvin's respect for Claire because her last name is Redfield is cool. Leon also has an exciting first day as a cop. He receives field training from Marvin, builds a relationship with him before turning to a zombie, and develops a semi-romantic relationship with Ada while unraveling the conspiracy around Umbrella. If you've seen any of my previous video essays, you'll know that I usually spend a chunk of time discussing my interpretation of themes and characters, but I don't have anything critical to say here. The story is just a fun ride with charming characters, period. I'm not going to dive into the relationship of how public and private institutions coalesce to socially engineer people or anything like that. It's not that kind of story and that's perfectly fine. It'd be boring if everything was a metaphor, deconstruction, or social commentary. Sometimes you just have to grab some popcorn and have a good time, and RE2R story certainly delivers. The next area I'd like to discuss is the incredible gameplay. Before we get into it, I'd like to remind everyone that if you're enjoying this video, a subscription and a like would go far away in helping the channel grow. If you really enjoy my content and would like to further support my creative endeavors here, please consider becoming a channel member where you'll receive early access to new videos, shoutouts at the end of my videos, and access to my outlines, scripts, and other project management tools I use to get these videos out. Thank you so much for your support and back to the video. The best way to describe RE2R's gameplay is as an evolution of the original remake. This game preserves its survival horror identity with finite resources resources, challenging resource management, and high-risk exploration in an unsettling atmosphere. The reason I referred to this game as an evolution was largely due to its quality of life changes. In RE2R, 
Players can now consume herbs without picking them up. There are no more door opening cutscenes. It introduces precision third person aiming, allowing for limbs to be destroyed, zombies move sporadically, and the flashlight illuminates a path forward. All of these mechanical changes with the improved graphics and abandoning tank controls for more fluid movement makes this game an absolute joy to play. Thankfully returning from the original, RE2 2019 preserves the original's first and second runs. Second runs provide additional firearms, new save points, different item locations, new enemy places, X is introduced earlier, and other changes providing this game even more replay value. This was a great idea in 1998, and it was a great idea five years ago in 2019. Anyways, Capcom went the extra mile with these additional routes because they show what Leon or Claire is doing based on the character that you select. In my Claire run, for example, you meet Leon outside of the gate in the East Wing. On your first run, you're probably unsure how he even got there while you search for an exit to the police station. However, when playing from Leon's perspective in the second run, you can see where he finds his gun, police uniform, and how he ends up outside of the station. Seeing how well this is done and how much replay value this game receives with this makes me wish that more games with two main characters had additional runs instead of these flashback sequences where you play as them. This criticism is hard though because a lot of assets are obviously reused with additional runs, but I'm I'm sure developers can get creative. Nevertheless, it's staggering how much the opening hours actually change based on which run you select, and Capcom deserves some credit here. Now, if only another remake could have retained more from its original. Getting back on topic, the classic survival horror gameplay is better than it's ever been, but there's part of me that misses fixed camera angles and tank controls as well. Now, before you call me a decrepit geriatric creature, I can explain. As stated in my original Resident Evil video, I know fixed camera angles and tank controls receive a lot of flack, but they're actually quite charming once you get used to them. Fixed cameras provide a cinematic feel, enhances the overall atmosphere through limiting how much control we have, and forces players to experience these environments as the developers intended. When you hear something creepy, know when enemies around a corner, or get unsettled by the environment, you need to look for clues in the environment and persevere forward. Like, can you imagine how scary it would be in RE2R if you just heard the helicopter lift and some heavy footsteps? Have started to approach you, it would have been a great moment seeing X just appear out of the corner of your screen. There is also some novelty when thinking about how these angles and controls are direct byproducts of hardware limitations and how developers fully leverage them to create these unique horrifying atmospheres. This resulted in me being more scared during my first run of the RE1 remake because of the angles, lack of precision controls, and what was deliberately hidden from me. To be clear though, this isn't a slight or an issue with RE2R but it would have been great if Capcom added them because they are very special, even if developers don't reflect fondly on them. Oh well, at least we have the modding scene and indie games to keep these alive. An area, however, that I don't mind being a little bit more critical on are with the bosses. Now, in my analysis of the original Resident Evil, I didn't touch on the bosses because I actually forgot out they were in the game. I'm pretty mixed on the inclusion of bosses in survival horror games for a few reasons. They're cool because sure they add variety to the core gameplay loop of exploring, finding resources, saving, and progressing, but this is a double-edged sword. While it's great to shake things up, the tonal dissonance from all my resources are valuable to I need to use everything I have to kill this thing at all costs feels kind of jarring and just out of place, honestly. Bosses in survival horror games run the risk of feeling like artificial engagements aimed at draining precious resources. They can feel like road blocks, especially for new players that may have used all their resources simply getting there. I vividly remember starting over my first run of the RE1 remake because of how punishing running out of ink ribbons, ammo, and other resources were while I was exploring. Sure, ink ribbons are gone now unless you play on hardcore, but new players run the risk of exhausting all of their ammo before stumbling upon a boss. And while boss stages do provide ammo and other resources, I'm not entirely sold if there's always enough unless you're either here or here. Another nitpick I have with bosses is how similar they feel as well. A majority of the bosses find you dumping resources into a specific area. The most creative fight is probably the crane fight where you have to bump Birkin off the platform with the cargo container. Other than that, you're usually just dumping bullets into Birkin or dying in one hit to the alligator or chief iron. The chief iron section has been dissected to death, so I'll keep this short. The shift in tone from survival horror to a more modern contemporary horror was an interesting choice, but it's hard to make touch of deaths feel fair, especially when you don't know iron scripted path. Additionally, Dying too many times in one hit runs the risk of transforming the haunting atmosphere into a frustrating trial and error scenario. While dying in one hit is rough, it's certainly less painful than other games that come to mind. With that said, I also believe the bosses are unfortunately the best they can probably be within their system. The classic survival horror design Capcom Revisited is honestly sort of bare bones when exclusively focusing on mechanics. You'll begin to realize that all we can do is run, shoot, walk, 
throw grenades and use defensive items. Creating bosses that test player skill is difficult when the system doesn't have any mechanics to necessarily master. To be abundantly clear, I'm not saying Resident Evil needs to be like a character action game, but these mechanical limitations explain why bosses are the way they are, which is why I'm apathetic to them. When or if you complete all four runs, you'll become intimately familiar with these bosses and may forget they're even in the game. I guess what I'm trying to say is that I'm mixed on bosses and survival horror as a whole. They're easy enough to get through and add some variety to runs, sure, but their existence clashes with the survival horror tone and they're usually very simplistic. Speaking of simplistic, something that's anything but is this game's remarkable levels from start to finish. For this section of the essay, I'm going to mimic my approach with Remake's level design discussion and highlight a few aspects that make them so memorable. Classic RE level design is bolstered by its deliberate save room locations, enemy placements, shortcuts allowing for easier traversal, looping level design, creating a disproportionate danger to resources provided, and forcing players to create internal risk reward scenarios before leaving a safe room and or exploring an undiscovered area. This game design philosophy is as engaging as it is today as it was 28 years ago when it was pioneered. These fundamental principles are timeless and my praises don't end here. The team also decided to include some quality of life changes, somehow enhancing this masterful design philosophy. RE2R forces players to constantly be immersed in its atmosphere as doors no longer have animations tied to them. I'm not sure about everyone else, but seeing a door occasionally provided me a brief moment of respite. Nevertheless, this doesn't exist in RE2R. Zombies and other enemies will now break doors in their pursuit of you. It's a very small and obvious thing today, but it's a night and day addition when you play Remake and RE2R back to back. And zombies, when you inevitably run into them, are more dynamic and dangerous than they've ever been. Zombies in this game feel very spongy, have limbs you can shoot off, move very randomly, and sound great. Zombies being able to take a beating really reinforces the RE lore of them being these borderline indestructible creatures. Combine this with the limited resources and you really don't want to waste any shots. This is why I usually shoot them in their calves, as you can probably realize throughout the video, as it forces them to crawl, uses less ammo, and makes their approach much more predictable. The next element I'd like to cover are liquors and how their existence enhances the overall level design. Lickers are very dangerous because they inflict a ton of damage and are the fastest enemy in the game. However, they're also blind which forces you to sneak around them or expend valuable resources fighting them. While this sounds very rudimentary, their design genius becomes obvious when viewed alongside classic survival horror design. Engaging with Lickers prompts the player to run through several hypothetical situations, especially on their first run. Players can either walk around them, fight them with your most valuable ammo, die because you may not have resources to fight them, and run the risk of attracting X's attention. Combine all of these fears with their deliberate placements around key items and you create these micro survival horror moments within the survival horror framework. By micro survival horror moments, I'm referring to all the planning required to deal with liquors. Close your eyes and try to remember how excited you were to find your first key. When you receive that key, you'll probably look at the map and figure out a path, right? You might die to zombies, use all your resources, and have to reload a save or two. This scenario if you don't quit, will force players to start planning their routes, create safe paths, learn which fights are worth taking, and just play Resident Evil. The reason liquors are so special and integral to the level design is because the game really forces you to slow down and consider your approach. We're forced to commit to a fight since its limbs can't be destroyed. We're also forced to consider if you think a boss is coming up, X's potential location, the closest doors to escape with, routes you can reposition with, and or how badly you need to eliminate them. Furthermore, the developers knew they were a challenging enemy, which is why they were very deliberate with their placings. Lickers are often found around key objectives, major checkpoints, paths, or protect valuable items forcing players to actually interact with them. Lickers alone add another layer to the overall map design, and I think they're one of Capcom's best designed enemies. They almost function like recurring mini-bosses throughout the game and have different locations based on which character and run you pick. Another key enhancement that this game's levels incorporate is with the enhanced atmosphere. As alluded to earlier, an area that received a lot of modernizing were of course the environments. There are still bright areas where you can see things, sure, but certain areas and hallways are now much darker. My first time reaching the second floor of the West Wing immediately comes to mind here. When you walk in, all you hear is the rain crashing in, your footsteps hitting the floor, you see a zombie corpse, 
blood on the floor and a dark hallway barely illuminated by your flashlight as you push forward. And as you approach the star's office, you're greeted with a liquor dining on a five-star meal. I obviously can't capture my first time seeing this, but I'm sure I was terrified. It's such an effective use of combining environmental storytelling with an enemy introduction that's built upon RE2R's incredible atmosphere and overall design. Let me know in the comments of your favorite moments like these that you've experienced in Resident Evil and other franchises. I'd love to hear everyone's stories. Another horrifying aspect is Mr. X's introduction and how it entirely changes the station. Mr. X, or Tyrant, which nobody calls him, is introduced at different times depending on which run you choose. He's either stalking or hunting you throughout the police station and appears in a few scripted moments. His existence adds another layer of stress and timeliness around whether you can actually do things. I won't spend too much time on him though because him and Nemesis are some of the most beloved and analyzed creatures from the Resident Evil lore. Instead, I just wanted to quickly highlight how horrifying his footsteps are and how much more challenging navigating the station is with him active. The most difficult moment, of course, being navigating the library with all those shelves. Successfully dispatching zombies while attracting X and losing him through leveraging the intricate level design is one of the most unique and frustrating parts of the game. Nevertheless, the entire game does not take place in the station. After permanently leaving the station, you'll head to the sewers before going to the nest lab. The sewers are actually pretty small when you're not lost, of course. They have some basic puzzles with the chess pieces, provides a new weapon, keeps the looping level design, introduces a new enemy type, slows down your movement in the water, and has as a puzzle boss at the end of it. Nest, or the lab, reintroduces the station's dark atmosphere, sees the return of the flashlight, has a futuristic setting with cutting edge technology, introduces a new plant type enemy, and has some minor puzzles and backtracking before fighting a few bosses as the series keeps up tradition. If you've seen my remake analysis, I'm going to sound like a broken record here, so let's get straight to the point. These levels lack the overall scope, sometimes the interconnectivity, and require much more backtracking than the station, but they accomplish what they set out to do. They introduce new ideas, add a variety to the game, and most importantly, they don't drag or overstay their welcomes. In my opinion, the consistent overall level design of this game is an outstanding achievement. Before revisiting this game and deciding to make this video essay, I consider the original remake as the pinnacle of survival horror. With that said, all of the changes and enhancements I've discussed in this video transforms remake's incredible foundation into what I'd argue is actually the apex of classic survival horror design. This game trades tank controls, the fixed cameras, ink ribbons, door loading screens, and other antiquated mechanics to create Capcom's most succinct survival horror game to date. When I close my eyes and remember my first run of remake, I remember the adversity I had to overcome to beat the game. I remember constantly dying, being lost, running out of saves, and getting used to tank controls and the camera. In spite of this, and after beating it several times, I firmly consider it to be one of the best games I've ever experienced. But in order to experience this masterpiece and recommend it to the modern audience, there is an inevitable learning curve that comes from the movement and the camera. The learning curve, even with the incredible foundation established, has been enough for plenty of my friends to ignore the 2001 classic. However, those days are now behind me as I can confidently recommend what I consider to be Capcom's best remake, Resident Evil 2. All right, now it's time for the best part of the video, the outro. So thank you so much for making it to the end of the video and massive shout out to the channel members for making this video possible and for supporting me. Like I really never would have thought I, <laughs> I never thought I would have gotten this far. So thank you so much for everybody that supports me and shout out to the members that you see on screen right now. Um, So a few questions before we close out this video, you know, how'd you guys get into RE? What, which is your favorite game? Did you like the RE3 remake? Did you like the RE2 remake of all the remakes, including four, which one's considered your personal favorite and which RE would you like to cover next on the channel the other thing too uh so let's talk about that last video so not at all related to resident evil but uh, if you are a, if you, if you're a subscriber from one of the previous videos or from the SMT4 video and you're watching like all the variety content, I really appreciate that. And thank you so much. That is the fastest I've ever had a video just blow up, at least for, for my channel standards. And yeah, I just never would have thought to, uh, yeah, I just never would have expected that. So thank you so much everybody for watching liking, subscribing, making it through that video, and for all the incredible comments um, and the discussion that we have in the uh, in the comment section below. So great video. Again, thank you so much for watching. Welcome to all the new subscribers. As you guys can probably tell from my channel trailer and from all my other videos, uh, this is a variety channel. Uh, I do plan on discussing SMT5. I have been streaming that a bit here on the channel and on Twitch, so feel free to catch me live. I'm thinking about 
covering it sometime soon, like in the next coming months. But there's a couple of other smaller projects that I've wanted to make for a while. But at the same time, I also have like 400 gigs of like SMT5 footage. So that video might come out in the, in the, uh, in the coming months. But one last reminder, just again, be sure to leave a like if you enjoy the video. Maybe consider subscribing and maybe consider watching this video before the, uh, the next one comes out, whatever that is. So uh, yeah, I guess I'll check in with y'all later. Again, thank you for everything and, uh, and I'll catch you guys later.